So um, just wanted to let you guys know, I'm actually Pastor Lenny here, uh, assistant pastor. Um, I'll actually be leading a team uh, to Mexico too with Justin. And so it's just an amazing time. This has probably been my probably seventh or eighth time going to Mexico. So this has been my first rodeo. But every experience is always a new one, right? It's always a new beginning. 
Um, just to reiterate, we will be leaving this coming Saturday at 3 a.m. in the morning. So most of the drivers will probably not be getting any sleep. So we ask for your prayers for this. Um, what we'll be doing over there is we're going to be doing uh, painting. Uh, there's going to be four facilities, uh, four rooms we're actually going to be painting um, to actually uh, just bless the children there at, at San Quentin. Uh, we're also going to be doing a women's ministry over there, blessing all the women over there. That um, Just really, I think a lot of people that know about Mexico, women are always constantly working so hard out there. They don't really ever have time to just spend time with just fellowshipping within just the females. And so this time we get to just be able to just allow the women to come and just feed them and to bless them and just to just have a good time of uh, fellowship with them. Um, of course, we'll always be, uh, also be doing BBS with the children over there too. Um, Michelle has been one of our um, our uh, missionary kids, actually, well not missionary kids, but one of the girls that we've been sponsoring and helping out throughout the years. And uh, this time, uh, we're actually going to be going there, and this, this part we're actually going to be going to Bay of LA, so we're actually going to two places. One in San Quentin and one in Bay of LA. So um, it's going to be five hour differences from each other. So Michelle's part of Bay of LA, and she's, she's actually, we've been actually talking to her, and she's been expressing that she's always wanted to go to college. She's never been able to go to college. Her family has never been to college. It's a small little fishing town that no one ever thinks about going to college. It's just, they just do their thing there. Just, yeah, there really isn't anything out there. So we're going to have an opportunity to share that with her and actually um, Hillside will actually be able to help her make this happen. So um, when we go there this time, we're actually going to ask her and, and actually help her fund um, her to go to college. So, you know what, let's just give a round of applause. It's you guys that are making this happen, guys. So, you know what, um, just because our team is going, you guys are also going with us. So, with that being said, during the time that we're going there, go on to your Instagram and follow us. We'll be posting new videos and pictures every single day that we're there, so you guys will be part of this mission trip just as part of us, too. Um, so we ask definitely for safety uh, for the team going there, um, and even you know God just being going ahead of us and just paving the way for us, and just even all the preparations that's going into it right now. We're not there. Yeah, a lot of us are just a bunch of laggards, I guess. <laughs> but we're still, there's a lot of stuff that we still need to do. So um, so we definitely ask you guys for just uh, prayer and just just really just keep praying for us this whole entire week. We really need you guys. As you can tell, we have a really, really huge group. So, um, um, you know what? If anybody's here from the mission team, we would ask you to stand up so we're actually, we can actually pray for you guys. Um, so if there's anybody from the mission team, we would ask you to stand up. Um, Amy, can you, yes, can you come up here? She's actually going to pray for our team right now. So. Actually, can I have Justin, Jason, are you guys in the house? Can you guys stand over here? We'd love to just reach our hands out to you guys. Anybody else from the mission team? I know that. Carlos, would you like some prayers? Brother? Oh, he's working. <laughs> we'll be praying for you. Okay. So if you guys can just reach out your hand um, towards um, the team here. We actually have more than this number going. A few of them are actually preparing the meal for us outside. And by the way, my name is Amy, and I um, and me and my husband, Ed, would lead the Wednesday prayer nights. So we've been praying for the missions team. Justin, here, I want to give this to you. These are cards that we've written for you guys with prayers inside. Um, but we're going to pray for you guys right now as a congregation. So lift up your hand and just... Spread them towards the team here, and let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, for sending your Son to us, your Son Jesus Christ, to die for us when we are still in sin, God. We thank you for the glory that you have revealed in him, that he's seated at the right hand at the throne, and all authority has given to him. And I thank you, Lord, that before Jesus ascended, Jesus, you told us to wait for you, for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, and then to go and witness to the world of who you are and what you have done for us, to free us from our sins, God. So we thank you, Lord. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon this team right here in Jesus' name as they take the charge that you have given them, the great commission 
that they are to go out to make disciples, God, to share the love of Christ, to share the gospel, Lord. May you go before them, God. May you send your angels before them and protect their vehicles, Lord. May you keep them safe, God. May you plead the blood of Jesus over their vehicles, over their family, over their bodies, Lord, as they go, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you help them put on a heart of love as they reach out to those who you have called them to in Mexico, Lord. May they be filled with compassion, with love, gentleness, kindness, and patience, God. And may they do everything in the name of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for the children and the women and the families there, Lord. All of those who are dying to know you, who are thirsty and hungry, Lord. I pray that as our team goes out, that they will be able to feed them Jesus, Lord, because you are the bread from heaven, Lord. That you are the living water, Lord. So that whenever we consume you and invite you into our hearts, that we would never go hungry and we would never be thirsty, Lord. So we pray this upon the cities and the towns that they will travel through, Lord. Lord, we pray, we pray, we pray for revival in the hearts to break out. That your Holy Spirit will minister powerfully through these vessels who are surrendered to you, who is prepared for every good work to serve their master, who is you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your blessings upon them. May you watch over their family as they are away, and may you bring them home safe, God. We thank you, Lord. May you multiply the fruits of their labor. May every relationship that they build there last into eternity. Because that is what you have for all of us. And we thank you so much for choosing us to be your hands and feet here on earth. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, mission team. I mean, it is just to hear, you know, the, the mighty work that God is doing, you know, through these folks that sacrifice their time. And, and you know the resources to just go down there. Please, 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 I ask that you show your support. Today they're having some fundraiser out there. They're cooking up some really delicious Mexican style hot dogs. If you guys haven't tried it, please go out there, check it out, and let's support our team. Okay. With that said, you know we're going to go into catechism, and as you know, catechism is an instruction and basis of our Christian faith. And let's profess our faith with conviction as we read the catechism. So do you, please, uh, do you all have your bulletins with you? It's at the back of the bulletin. If we can all stand, if we can all stand. Thank you guys, yeah. So if you don't have a bulletin, please uh, grab one out there and it's right at the back of the, uh, the bulletin there. I'm gonna read the question and after I read the question, if you, we can all answer the, the, if we can all read the answer below the question, okay? All right. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Christian Church? I believe that the Son of God, out of the whole human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, defends, and preserves for himself. By his spirit and word, in the unity of true faith, a church chosen to everlasting life. And I believe that I am, and forever shall, remain a living member of it. Question 55. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers, all and everyone, as members of Christ, have communion with him and share in all his treasures and gifts. Second, that everyone is duty bound to use his gifts readily and cheerfully for the benefit and well-being of other members. Question 56. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, nor my sinful nature, against which I have to struggle all my life, but will graciously grant me the righteousness of Christ, that I may never come into condemnation. Amen. Now we're also going to do scripture reading for the message, for our message. It's Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
Now Pastor Andy will come up and deliver the message on who are you. Let's open our hearts and tune our ears. Morning, church. My name is Pastor Andy. I'm going to be teaching pastors here at Hillside. Uh, today we are going to explore a question that men and women, adult and children, rich and poor, and people from every corner of the world have been asking themselves since the start of humanity. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Because that question is identity shaping, it's life altering, it's eternity affecting. How would you describe yourself? How would you introduce yourself? How do you perceive yourself? What is your identity? It's the one thing that changes everything. Because when you know who you are, then you know what to do. And if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what to do. And for most of us, the question of identity begins to be formed at a young age in our families and communities. Let me give you a snapshot of what life has looked like and will look like for many of us in this room. So it starts when we're children in our families. Were you the firstborn? Were you the baby in the family? Were you the middle child? What were you like? Were you a rule follower or a rule breaker? Were you the line leader in class or were you the kid secretly eating glue? at the back of the room? Were you the funny kid? Were you the athletic kid? What labels were given to you when you were young? And we move forward in life and we hit our teen years. And then life becomes incredibly complicated. We're all going through puberty and not only are all our identities changing internally, but now our bodies are also changing physically and we're changing and our friends are changing and everything just feels chaotic. And our identities are so rooted in just fitting in and wanting to belong. I remember as a guy how important it was getting armpit hair for the first time. Right now, I'm like two chia pets, if you see me on TikTok. But back then, I remember comparing with my best friend, like, oh man, it's starting to come in. You know, those first two or three hairs coming, like, it was so important to our identity as, like, oh, I'm a man now, so I'm getting armpit hair. Right? And you hit middle school and you just have no idea who you are. You're in a new school, you have new friends, new responsibilities, new teachers, and everyone is giving you their input, who you think you should be. And you desperately don't want to let anyone down. You just want to fit in. And in this phase of life, the opinions of our friends becomes a whole world. So that one snarky comment, one insult, one misspoken word, it could ruin your entire week because our egos and identities are so fragile. You guys remember those times? I mean, looking back on it now, it seems so silly, doesn't it? Do you remember being 13 and just begging and begging your parents to buy you that one thing that you thought was going to bring you acceptance to your purity? I still remember it like it was yesterday. For me in junior high, you had to show up on the first day of school with a clean pair of fresh white pants and a Jan Sport backpack. Like that was, if you didn't have that, like man, you were a loser. And I remember having like a meltdown one year because my mom tried to buy me like a knockoff and I was like, no, it's gotta have Jan Sport on it. Can't be some, you know, bootleg version. And it seemed so important at the time, right? Life moves forward and now you graduate high school. And all of a sudden, you have this opportunity to reinvent yourself. You might want to change your style. How am I going to dress? Your lifestyle. Am I going to go to church? Am I not going to go to church? Am I going to party? Am I not going to party? Your future. What major am I going to pursue? What career am I going to go for? And just when you start to feel like you're getting a hang of it, you hit the reset button. Because now you have all these new freedoms and responsibilities. You graduate college and enter your mid 20s now, and it's a full on quarter life crisis. Because all of a sudden you're supposed to be an adult, but no 23 year old is prepared for responsibilities. Right? I mean, where will I work? How do I pay my taxes? What car can I afford? Where do I live? Do I really have to separate my two colors when I do laundry? 
Will I be single forever? Will I wear box for like none of these things are in an instruction manual and all of a sudden we're just expected to act like a grown-up? It's, it's an identity crisis. Then many of us get married, all of a sudden your identity gets very conflicted. You go from being a one to being a two in everything that you do. You thought that marriage was going to help you become who you want to be, and your spouse thought the same thing. But suddenly, two selfish sinners with separate identities collide. And now both of you are just trying to figure out how to step into this new role of being a husband or a wife, right? Without somehow completely losing the person you were before marriage, and at all time not wanting to kill your spouse or leaving the toilet together, or for leaving a gross pumped hair at the bottom of the shower or eating the last bit of ice cream that you were saving for yourself at the end of a long day. Now all your decisions, they don't just affect you, they affect the whole family. And everything feels completely different and foreign. Then we have kids. And again, just when you were starting to get a hang of the whole husband-wife thing, you hit the reset button one more time. And for the woman, it starts with the change of appearance. Now she's shown and she's feeling different. She's turning into a mother with all those instincts kicking in. And the man feels the weight of that responsibility to be a protector, to be a provider. And both of you are trying to figure out this new identity as a parent, all while being sleep deprived and trying to stop this new little human being from, from you know, from, uh, you know, just the, you're just trying to keep them alive, right? And they want to poop and burp and eat or sleep every two hours. Not necessarily in that order. And then they grow up, and all of a sudden, their weekdays, bath time, homework checking, uh, bedtime stories, weekends, birthday parties, soccer practice, dance recitals. All your money now goes towards saving up for summer vacations and Christmas gifts, and once again, your identity is locked. Then your kids get older, they get their driver's license, they're spending more time with their friends. You're getting into arguments about curfews, and you start saying those phrases you swore you never would to your own kids. Why do you have to? Because I said so. Or how about this one? As long as you're living under my roof, you'll obey my rules. But then they actually do move away. They move away for college or for work, and you hit that empty nest seat. And once again, you're at the who am I? Who are we? Now that the center of our world is gone, what do I do? We used to try to hold this marriage together or make money or be at the church for the sake of our kids, but they're gone now. So who, who are we? What are we doing? It seems like we spend so much of our lives just figuring out that question. Where do we fit in? Where can we find the answer? And with so many changes in our lives, so many different circumstances and voices influencing who we think we are, where do we go for this critical question? Who are you? So today, for the next few weeks, that's exactly what we're going to try to answer. Today, I'm going to be presenting a sort of words I look into what an identity is and the ways that we try to form it. In the following couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be doing a study of how we form identity, our identity, by first looking at the character of God. I don't want to give away my final point too quickly, but that is truly the only place we should ever look to determine our worth and who we are, who we really are. Not just who you say you are, not who others say you are, but to discover your true identity First, you have to come into the presence of God. You have to look upon His glory and character to determine your own self. Today, there's going to be three key points. First, we're going to look how we look incorrectly inside of ourselves and our own desires to form our identity. Second, we're going to look at how we incorrectly look to others when we should be looking at God. And finally, we'll look at how an identity that is founded in God can change your whole life. So first, what is an identity? Your identity is a self-understanding 
It's who you think you are fundamentally at your core, and also whether you actually feel good about that or not. It's a sense of self that's durable and enduring. It's who you are that doesn't change based on your circumstance, because again, there has to be a stable core of you, a core that's true from day to day, year to year, situation to situation. Besides a sense of self, identity also includes a sense of worth and a sense of value. It's a sense that you are a significant person and that you matter. And unless you have all those things, you don't really have a complete identity. So point number one, the first place we wrongly look to find our identity is inside our own hearts. And this is more prevalent and common today than in any time of modern culture, right? Today's woke culture has dangerously made this a norm for young people. Our society is all about self-definition. You can't tell me who I am. I get to decide. Don't put labels on me. Don't tell me who I am or what I can or can't do, who I can or can't be. No one gets to decide that. I get to decide for myself. Our culture has redefined the process, the method, and the structure of how we identify ourselves and how others identify us. For you parents in here, I don't want to trigger you, but if you think about this, a song from the movie Frozen, it's a perfect reflection of that idea. I mean, I know a lot of your kids, when you watch that movie twice a day for three months straight, and every time you got into the car, you had to listen to the soundtrack, but just bear with me for a moment. Think about what that song from the movie is actually saying about identity. Do you want to go to Snowman? Just kidding, not that song. All right, so think about the message of the song, Let It Go. What does Elsa say? You gotta let it go. You can't hold back. Don't be the good girl that they think you should be. I don't care what they're gonna say. I'm gonna be who I wanna be. I'm gonna be who I am. I'm gonna express what's inside. And that's how modern culture is telling you how you should form your identity. It's how they're brainwashing our kids one Disney movie at a time. Modern culture's narrative is no one has the right to tell me who I am. I look inside myself, I look inside my heart, and I become the truest version of myself as I pursue those desires. But looking inwards is hugely problematic in two ways. Your heart is sinful in nature, and your heart at its core is in so first and foremost, your heart is filled with all kinds of sinful and ungodly desires. I don't want to spend too much time here because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know, right? I mean, if I offered you ten thousand dollars cash, but in exchange, you would have to post your deepest, darkest, ugliest thoughts that you've had on the internet where everyone can see. I don't think anyone would take that deal, right? I mean, as I was writing my sermon, I was trying to think of examples of like uh, dark and uh, you know, shameful thoughts, but then I was like, oh man, you're gonna know my dark and shameful thoughts. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give, drop a few Bible verses here instead. Right? Because we know how dark this is, right? But the part that you're afraid to show everyone, Genesis 6-5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Mark 7, that which proceeds out of man, that is what defiles man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of covenant and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Romans 1, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, god haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Case closed, right? Don't need no need to beat this point. Bottom line, without God, we are a wicked, depraved people with wicked, depraved hearts. And your natural state of being will be to desire sin. This is not the place to go. 
when trying to form your identity. Secondly, your heart is inconsistent at its core. When it comes to building an identity, again, you want a reliable, stable core. While many of us wear different hats in our lives, there should be an essence of who you are and what you believe, regardless of the circumstance and regardless of the audience. So I'm a father and I'm a son, and I'm a husband and I'm a teacher and I'm a pastor and I'm a friend. There's all these other hats that I wear in my lap, in my life. But in all those things, there should be a core that makes me, right? To have integrity of any kind, you can't be a different person or version of yourself around different groups of people, there's got to be something fundamental to you. But our hearts are far too inconsistent and unstable to base our own identities on. Consider for a moment all the different decades of your life and all the different versions of you that have led to you being here today. You've probably had as many different identities as you've had hairstyles, right? Some are embarrassing and funny to think about, some are shameful, and some can take pride in, and some it's like a weird combination of all three. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you about 17-year-old Andy Lynn, who did not resemble in any way she performed this godly man that's before you today. I mean, if I'm honest, I was an embarrassing human being. This guy thought he was all that, two bags of chips, Driving around in a beat up in the room 1991 Civic, blasting Tupac and Bone Thugs and Harmony from a CD player that I plugged into the tape deck. You guys remember those? Right? It's, it's the ghetto sound system startup kit. And the CD player, you had to turn on the bass boost so you feel it, right? To show people how bad you were when you're bumping your hip hop. This guy, pretty much every other word out of his mouth, mouth was a profanity. Mother after this, and bleep bleep that. I mean, I was rocking beyond baggy jeans from those outposts. Adidas turtle shoes. The belt buckle with the letter initial that you hung down the sides so was like extra long, right? So you show how hard you are. You guys remember this dumb stuff? That's not just me. But here's the most embarrassing part. I may have talked the talk, I may have looked the part, but I was never a real gangster. I was a straight up gangster man. We got some real OGs in here. I'm just gonna say this, uh, that was a phony, man. Never been in a fight. And honestly, if anyone ever stepped to me, I would keep my pants. I mean, I wasn't that dude. Right? Like, the Lord blessed me with these little beady eyes and the heart just like a good. <laughs> that, that's as far as I go, man. Like, I was a phony. And I'm sure all of us in here, to a certain, like, we all have these embarrassing past versions of ourselves. But here's the problem. If your identity is just based on the desires of your heart, how do you reconcile that past version of you to who you are today? Because I'll tell you what, in that moment, when I was 17, I knew what I knew. I absolutely, positively believed that a 96 cent catchback with an 18 inch rim and a spoiler and body kit, like that was the best car to have. I knew for a fact that growing out my days long, slicking them back, like that was a good luck. Like those, I knew that in my heart. Your core identity needs to have a core of stability and consistency, but when your identity is built on the desires of your heart, what happens to your identity when your desires change? Year to year, life phase to life phase. Paul sums up the problematic nature of looking for your identity within beautifully in Romans 7. I do not understand what I do, for I want to do, for what I want to do I do not do, for what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. 
mean, that sounds like an identity crisis, right? I mean, he knows his heart is sinful, and he knows the desires of his heart are sinful, and he knows his actions are unstable and incoherent. He doesn't do what he wants to do, he hates what he does. This is not the place to go. But if we can't look inwards and rely on our own thoughts and desires to form our identity, then what do we do? This leads to point number two. We look outside to the wrong source. No matter what modern society says, you can't decide for yourself who you are. You can't bless yourself. You can't validate yourself. You need someone from the outside to name you. Because for social beings, a word from outside has to give you that approval. We need that love and approval and esteem of someone that you esteem if you're going to have any self-esteem. And in our hunger and in our thirst for identity, we go to all the wrong places for validation. Married people look to their spouses. Parents look to their children. Employees look to their bosses and job titles. Bosses look to their power and reputation. Entire people groups look to their ethnic heritage, all to decide and determine who am I. But the issue of looking to other people to determine our identity there are all the same reasons why we can't look to ourselves, just like you. Other humans are just as sinful and selfish. They're just as inconsistent as, and unstable. So no matter who they are, they're going to fail you at some point. They're going to disappoint you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to hurt you, sometimes unintentionally, but a lot of times with full and malice because our hearts are filled with sin. The other problem with looking outwards to form your identity is how do you figure out which voice is right, whose opinion really matters. See, if you ask my daughter, my beautiful three-year-old daughter, who her daddy is, she'll say, I'm the best. My beautiful angel. If you ask my students that I'm a teacher of who Mr. Lin is, they'll say that I'm a heartless tired of hell man on making your lives miserable. If you ask my mom who I am, she'll say I'm an angel with a heart of gold. If you ask my sister, she'll say, oh, he's an irresponsible knucklehead who can't remember anything. And if you ask my wife, who knows me better than anyone, she's likely to give you 19 different answers based on how we did that. <laughs> if you're gonna base your identity on what other people say about you, where, where do you begin? How do you determine or how do you justify which opinion is valid and which one isn't? Your heart? You're going to decide for yourself? Then we're back at square one, right? Because you can't go here. It's a broken system that's setting you up for identity crisis again and again. We incorrectly look outside to people, positions, and possessions to validate our identity when God has already supplied the needed essentials of love, significance. He wants to resolve your identity crisis. And he's the only one worthy and trustworthy of a massive responsibility. So what does God say about who you are? What does God say about your identity? Let's, let's look at our scripture for today. It's just one verse. All right, we're going to go all the way to the beginning to figure out who we are. Genesis chapter 1. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. Who are you? Who do you think you are? The Bible says that you are a being that is made in the image and likeness of God Almighty. Let that sink in just for a second. You are made in the likeness of God, the creator of the universe, the one who holds oceans in his hands, the one who put the stars in the sky, the one who spoke mountain ranges into existence. That's the prototype that you were made from. That's the breath that fills your lungs. That is your identity. You are made by glory, in glory, for glory. You are made in the image of God Himself. What does that mean? It means that you're meant to reflect the likeness and character of God. It doesn't just mean that in our physical flesh, but it means that in the essence of who we are, 
we are made to almost be like a mirror to reflect God's likeness. God is saying, I've created you to reflect my glory, to reflect my goodness, my love, my character of the world. And I want you to face me so that my character is reproduced in you. And then the way in which you treat the world and the people around you is going to reflect that glory. And if you don't face God, if you don't look to God and face his love, if you don't get your beauty and your sense of significance and worth from God, you're going to have to turn and worship something else. You're going to look elsewhere for your validation because that's how you were created. God is the only one worthy of this immense responsibility and duty to give you your identity. He's the only one who has no selfish motives. He's the only one who stays, stays the same. He's the only one you can trust. The only one who will never fail. Everything in our lives will be turn to us. Every other person or relationship is deeply flawed in some way. God and only God will stay the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that is why God is where we start building and rebuilding our sense of self. That is why God is where we need to go to answer the critical question. Finally, what does identity in God mean for us? First, it means freedom and rest. Outside of Christianity, we are constantly being judged on our performance. And this is something that personally I struggle with all the time. Even as a pastor, I'm constantly worrying and stressing about my performance, how I'm going to do. Your identity works like this outside of this journey. Because I've done X, Y, and Z, because I've accomplished X, Y, and Z, now I can feel good about myself. Now I'm worth. Now I have value. But the Christian gospel is the only system in the world that gives a radically different identity because Christianity says that your identity is received, not achieved. Every other system says, if you follow the rules of reform, then you're accepted. But Christianity says, no, no, no. You're accepted, and now you can perform. When God establishes your identity, you can rest. When we allow God to occupy his designated place in our lives, we can experience the freedom and harmony because it frees you up from the performance track. It frees you up from being competitive against others. It frees you from the bitterness and jealousy that you feel when you covet what you do not have. If you let God be God, and you just be you, then you can rejoice in all things. So it doesn't matter if you take a risk and fail, because it's not about your performance, because Christ is already in the work. You are free from the pressure of being perfect. Because we don't work for our identity. We work from our identity. The Lord has created you and declared you good. So you can rest. You don't have to earn it. Second, if your identity is rooted in Christ, it also means stability. It means that you can weather the storms that come in your life. That the unpredictable changes don't have to lead to an identity crisis. And it means that when you suffer tragedy and suffering and loss, that you don't have to lose your sense of self. So if you lose your job, you're okay, because you're more than your job title. If you lose your beauty and your looks, you're okay, because God tells you your value goes far beyond a pretty face or a fit body. If you lose your marriage, you're okay, because God says you're more than just a husband or a wife. If you lose your child, you'll be okay. Because your identity is so much more than just being a mom or a dad. Your identity in God will never change. Because God never changes. His love for you never changes. His faithfulness never changes. And Jesus' work on the cross never changes. As I close today, I'm going to invite the worship team back up. Can you guys bow your heads? Who are you, church? What is your identity? 
where have you been going to look for validation? To find a sense of worth? It's an uncomfortable question to ask. Because most of the time, the answer that we come up with, it just doesn't feel like enough, right? It falls short of everything that we thought we could be. Everything that we feel like we were meant to be, what we feel like we deserve. It just never feels like it's enough. So we keep trying and trying to fill that bucket, but it never gets full. We try to do more, earn more, have more, be more, 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 but it doesn't make a dent. Do you feel the weight of that burden? Who are you this morning? I hope and pray that you will plant your identity in the simple truth that you are God's creation. Brothers, you are made in the image of God. Sisters, you were formed in his likeness. That is who you are. And that's going to stay right there for all eternity.